Thanks, y'all. Welcome to this Coffee Hour event on Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Hi, for those that don't know me, I am Liz Grumbach. I am the Assistant Director for the Institute for Humanities Research, where I also lead the Digital Humanities Initiative. So we're here today to have a casual and hopefully generative conversation about emergence and about Brown's work. In a world where change is constant, emergent strategy gives us some tools to, as Brown says, learn to be in the right relationship with change. So we'll discuss that maybe a little bit today and discuss a few things. But before we get started and before I announce my Coffee Hour co-leader, I want to extend an intention. And I'm going to borrow a bit from the digital humanities community here at ASU to say that this is going to be a feminist and an anti-racist space. We are going to proceed from a place of care together, and we will be creating a virtual space where all are welcome and discrimination and intolerance are not tolerated. The structure for today's events will be something like we will uh, include introductory remarks from Dr. Mako Ward and then a facilitated discussion about emergent strategy and Adrienne Marie Brown's work and exploring the human relationship to change. And I want to start maybe by saying that I've come to emergent strategy many times over the past few years. Um, there was once a point where I was facilitating a lot of meetings and I used to read for myself and my co-facilitators the principles of emergent strategy aloud before we started because I'm a little bit of a nerd, I think. But I think that there's a lot of things in emergent strategy and in all of Brown's works that teach us how to be in relationship with each other and teach us how we can learn from things like science fiction and uh, visionary fiction. And I'm really looking forward to perhaps discussing all of that with y'all today. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce my uh, co-facilitator today, Dr. Mako Fitz Ward. She is an educator, a writer, a facilitator, and a social change advocate with over 15 years of experience teaching core principles of justice and social change to college students and advocating for racial and gender equity in communities around the country. She is an assistant professor of African American and Women and Gender Studies in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. Her work explores intersectional feminist analyses of popular culture, specifically urban youth cultures and their impact on contemporary social movements. She is also the co-editor of Pandemic Pedagogies, Social Injustice in the Time of COVID-19, forthcoming in spring of 2021 by Dio Press. And she is currently serving as a research fellow with the Attaway Group, a consulting firm that provides services in the areas of race equity, inclusion, social justice, strategic planning, and organizational change. Her work has been published in a wide range of journals, edited volumes, and popular news blogs. And for those reasons and many, many more reasons, I'm really excited that you're here with us today, Mako. Thank you for being here. And I think I'm going to turn the reins over to you for introductory remarks. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. I always enjoy working with you and I always enjoy connecting most with students, especially um, in this kind of informal space where we can just talk candidly and frankly about um, our thoughts on Adrienne Marie Brown's work, specifically the book uh, Emergent, you see here, Emergent Strategy, um, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. Uh, and what's exciting about this week is that I get to think about, think through, talk about um, the body of her work, is, which is something that I, I enjoy. I, I take pleasure in really grappling with a thinker's set of ideas as it manifests through texts, through conversations. So like watching interviews with her and, you know, seeing her engage her work and talk sort of in the you know, sort of obviously in the oral form about the ideas that she is, um, that she's passionate about. And so I often like to think of the scope of a person's work. So sometimes I will be talking about someone's work, but I'm really referencing a different book. I'm like, which book was that from? Especially someone like Brown who has so much to draw from. So I thought what we could do or what I would do is just initially share, um, oh, and now you see my email. There we go. <laughs> initially share some, um, just a, a way to kind of wrap our minds around um, or at Think of it as an entry point into what emergent strategy 
is, right? So right at the beginning of the book, she references uh, Nick Oblensky's idea, right? Emer of, around emergence. Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions, right? So here you see the uh, the Sierpinski triangle, right? It's a mathematically generated pattern or fractal, right? So it's in the shape, as we see, of an uh, the shape of an equilateral triangle. Um, and this triangle is reproducible at any magnification or reduction, right? So no matter sort of how it kind of moves in and out, it is a reproducing entity. It's all about reproduction. And one of the things right off the bat she tells us is to think about the emergent framework, emergence framework that she puts forward as um, the mirror of all of its parts. So think, and, and I love the use of the term fractal. I remember when I first read the book, I am not a mathematician. Um, the extent of my math engagement is statistics. Um, which is all, you know, obviously I, I rely heavily on computer programs to assist with that. Um, but her discussion and her use of uh, fractals and, and geometry and mathematics, some of it was triggering for me in that I was not the best at geometry and trigonometry and calculus in high school. So I was reading through some of this and I was like, oh my gosh. And it was giving me that feeling of, I'm not going to be able to understand what she's talking about. But what I love about her style of writing is that she makes it accessible. So while I might have first seen the word fractal and I was like, oh, I don't even remember what that means. She gives me another way of thinking about, right? So she might say fractal, and then she says, no, it's actually an infinitely complex pattern of self-similar um, uh, of self-similar forms across different scales, right? So she is, um, you don't have to be a mathematician and you don't even have to have an elementary understanding of fractals to really understand her use of fractal as both metaphor and in a literal sense, right? <clears throat> so I was really moved by that kind of ethic of care that she held as you're going through her book, as she's introducing you to ideas that may not feel comfortable for certain readers, she makes it comfortable for you. And she's talking about it in the context of larger um, ecologies, right? Um, larger sort of systems of health and care. And so she talks about the health of a cell, right? The health of a cell is the health of the species and thus the health of a planet. So when we were to think about these like large systems and we think about how we enter into discussions about systems level changing, oftentimes it's really um, daunting and it feels impossible when we think up here. But she really brings us down to the level of the cell, which is in some ways the metaphor for the smallest entry point by which we begin to engage the genesis of change work. That change work doesn't have to be change with the big C. Um, and I've been doing a lot of reading lately around this notion of the commons and um, uh, political theorist, Silvia Federici, she talks about the commons in two scales. She talks about the commons as a little C, right? The ways in which we create communities that are centered around an ethic of care and support and harmony and love and how the reverberation of all of these little C commons or communities of care that develop over time have the cumulative impact of the development of a big C, right? That then has the capacity to challenge larger systems of oppression. And so for me, that was my connection to Brown is that she's really taking us from this macro level, particularly social justice advocates, thinking about change on a global or macro level to thinking about the micro level and how individuals enter into spaces of change and what kinds of tools they need to be successful in that work. So here's my attempt to sort of offer these nuggets of how to frame and understand what emergent strategy is. And you'll see sort of page numbers associated with the idea. So it's a systems approach, right? And I know like from you know sociological or more social science perspective, when we think of systems, we think of 
the scale of large, right? The, the, the unit of analysis of a system is like up here. It's a big way of thinking about the organization of things, right? But she's arguing that a systems approach is necessary to make use of everything in the iterative or repetitive sort of process, right? It's all about emergent strategy is about group adaptation, how we combine the intelligence of many through deep authentic connections to be what she calls in right relationship, which if you come from a sort of Judeo-Christian spiritual background, that is a very familiar term, right? It's a biblical term. It's a term that's often used, particularly in the black church to talk about how do we hold again, this ethic of care and how do we engage in relationship building that comes from a place of goodness and of justice. So this sort of tethering of justice with an ethic of right, righteousness, not right as in I am intellectually correct, but a kind of moral or ethical centering of righteousness inside of the relationship building process. And that that process begins with the home. It begins with the kinds of relationships we build with those inside of our communities, whether it's our biological families or our chosen families, right? And that as we begin to build relationships, it's like the concentric ring effect that then has these reverberating impacts on the planet. And then she talks about emergent strategy as a plan of action, right? These practices and collective organizing tools that account for constant change and relies on the strengths of relationships for adaptation. And finally, it's a philosophy, right? It's a way of thinking about and holding how we can be in harmony and love with ourselves, with each other, and with the planet, right? I love her, um, her reference points, right? Octavia Butler, science fiction writing, thinking about science fiction as a mode of entry to organization and movement building. She talks about um, the need to sort of connect innovation with imagination, right? So she says, a visionary exploration of humanity includes imagination. We must imagine new worlds that transition ideologies and norms to envision all of us as potential cultural and economic innovators. And I think often when you're in a space like ASU, we're at a, a research institution where Often we hear this language of innovation and discovery, right? But at the core, research and innovation are about creativity. It's about how we operate in the realm of imagination. So regardless of your methods, regardless of the tools that you use, right? We're called to fail, fail again, fail some more with the hope that one of these times we will capture what it is that we are searching for that has the greatest impact for the greatest number of people. And so for activists, it's not just about politics, which is, you know, we think about politics in the realm of systems of governance, right? Or getting to the root cause of a problem, but it's also about the social and about the poetic. How do we shift our consciousness? How do we shift and move the culture in ways that hold an interaction of care with one another, right? And I wanna just end with, and this is on page 50, how to engage these elements. Again, there's so much rich um, perspectival and very concrete examples of these elements that she offers, right? So to be adaptive is about being in relationship, both big and small, right? So relationships are interpersonal, but there's also relationships between systems, between governance structures, between, and we know that individuals are responsible for actualizing those structures. Right? So there's always this kind of back and forth between the individual and the personal and the institutional, the structural or the public. Right? It's a very kind of feminist way of thinking about the personal as political um, and the political and institutional has impacts on the personal. Right? And so, and you can see these, they're on page, what did I say? Page 50, right? right? Thinking about possibilities. I just love her use of 
language that feels visionary, hence the reliance on science fiction. Um, and I hope that some of you in the room have read some of Octavia Butler's work or Ursula Le Guin or even Margaret Atwood. So this idea that we can turn to um, a type of speculative fiction writing that gets us thinking about the world that we want to live in. It's not just about naming the problems and naming the systems of oppression, but how do we begin to vision build and imagine the kind of communities and environments and spaces that we wanna see and make manifest. So I'm gonna close with Brown herself talking about what emergent strategy is and understanding what transformative justice looks like. And I think within the space of sort of the discipline of, of justice studies, there's a very specific understanding of transformative justice vis-a-vis -vis, um, systems relative to how a society um, manages harm and manages um, sort of engagements with harm on the, on the physical sort of person. But I think she has a much more expansive understanding of transformative justice that centers on relationship building, that centers on and really dives into a language of healing as a way of getting to the kind of society that we wanna live in. Let me just make sure that my, yep. Organizing for what we want, building collaborative strategies, and learning better ways of relating to one another and the planet. Adrienne Mary Brown talked about all that and more when I met with her recently in Detroit. She's a social justice facilitator, a pleasure activist, and the author of Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. She's also the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, science fiction from social justice movements. Here's Adrienne Mary Brown. Emergent strategies are ways of looking at the world, the natural world uh, that we're a part of, and searching for collaborative efforts. Like where does collaboration happen? Where is right relationship happening between humans and the planet, between different parts of the planet? And what can we as a species learn about how to be in right relationship with each other and with the planet that we're living on? We're filming this in September and We've just come through a week where there were three hurricanes, an earthquake, a potential tsunami. Um, there was flooding, there's droughts, there's a fire raging the entire West Coast. At the same time, all the news that's coming out of the White House is devastating for our folks. We have people who are like, DACA is the thing that has kept my family together, the thing that has allowed me to be in the place that I'm from. Everything feels like it's so heavy and so intense. And how do we survive this moment? It doesn't feel like we can. And emergent strategy posits actually all of these changes, these are something that we need to figure out how we embrace and how we also shape them. So emergent strategy is really life moves towards life, longing moves towards longing. And if we're not also organized towards what we really want and what we long for, we will always settle into just reacting and trying to stop something bad from happening. The trick of this book is that everything you need to know is on pages 41 and 42 <laughs> and on page 50. If you just read those two pages, or you can look at page 15, page 15 also basically has the entire thesis, everything about the book is right there. So this Octavia Butler quote, all successful life is adaptable, opportunistic, tenacious, interconnected, and fecund. Understand this, use it, shape God. So from that, I would say emergent strategy is learning how to be fractal. Small scale reflects a large scale how to be adaptive in right relationship to change, but also with intention. Because if you just change all the time, you're just changing all the time, you're just a mess, you're just a leaf blown in the wind. But changing with an idea of like, oh, I'm a bird, I'm trying to get to Mexico for my migration, a storm came, how do I still get myself to Mexico? Then nonlinear and iterative, resilient, being in a practice of transformative justice, which I think we are just beginning to understand what transformative justice is or could be for us as a species and then interdependent and decentralized and always creating more possibilities. One of my favorite examples right now from the net, you know, sort of the world of nature has been in this flooding that's been happening with the hurricanes, watching how ants have come together to survive. 
um, and they form, they basically create a foundation of their own bodies, like a bottom layer of their own bodies that then other ants climb on top of and climb on top of until they create this floating mound that then is able to make sure that the majority of them survive until they come across something that is a higher ground. Right now we are drowning in the overwhelm of this political moment and the overwhelm of our decisions. How do we reach out and hold on to each other knowing that holding on to each other makes us a more stable body that can actually float and not pushing each other down, not you know pushing each other under. Um, one of my favorite examples in the human world is actually the work of Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives and feeling like this was emergent. It's not like someone sat down at a table and was like, I've got it all figured out. I know how we're gonna catalyze black people into their liberation fight and taking direct action right now. That's not what happened. There was just a heartbreak. It really, to me, it grows out of a heartbreak. Like if you look at the original post that Alicia put, it was like, my heart is broken and our lives matter. And that that heartbreak was so catalyzing. Other people were like, yeah, how do we organize ourselves around what we long for and we believe in this moment when everything is telling us we don't matter, but we, we know we do. How do we move that? And that so many people answered that call and that they have really tried to hold like, oh, what does decentralization look like? How do we keep adapting to changing conditions? Things that organically emerge from a real desire and a real longing, those are the ones that catalyze the most other people. They're super compelling. Like when you see someone feeling a real emotion, that's what you want to move towards and, and be like, I want to be a part of this. It's not just getting me to sign my name on a petition. It's not just getting me to be a number in the street. You actually want me to care about my own life and my children's life. Yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. One thing I say in here several times is what you pay attention to grows. So this administration wants us to put all of our attention on them. And I would rather starve them of all of that attention to put all of it on the amazing work that's happening here in Detroit or in Jackson or in the Bay or in all these other places, St. Louis, where people are like, we are figuring it out, we're surviving. Um, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Okay. So I thought now I'll turn it back over to, to, to Liz to get us to the next portion. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much. And I see people are clapping. Um, thank you for the clapping emotions. Uh, just Dr. Ward Mako, that was amazing. Um, thank you for kind of kicking us off. Thank you for showing us that video of Adrian, right? I think that that it's really important to hear. Adrian. Um, so that was awesome. Um, and I absolutely love, I just want to start with it. So you are a page 50 person and I am a page 15 person. Yeah. And I just want to say that before I maybe stop the recording, that one of the things that mm -hmm. I think you highlighted and I, I, and I think, you know, it's, is very apparent when you hear Brown talk is that it's these moments of like almost poetry, right. Of, of organization within the book, within all of her work, right. That are, um, that are drawing from this deep tradition of mm -hmm. um, science fiction, visionary fiction, poetry, um, the way we the way we use language to organize um, around change and transform around change. And I, if you have any final thoughts about that that you want to say, that's awesome. But if not, we can open it up. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree. And also like imagery. So she's got these like little all throughout the book, these little like just just visual images and you know, I'm definitely a charts and graphs spreadsheet type of person. That's like my jam. Um, but I also understand when I'm called to like, just look at an image and try and kind of figure out like, what is the meaning? If I'm reading a text and it's juxtaposed with this really um, kind of interesting image, especially the one on page 191, where you see ants and, um, leaves and flies and birds. And I imagine this to kind of be, you know, in the wind, like how am I meant to really use my creative muscle to understand what it is she's trying to convey in that image. Um, yeah, and those offerings that the creative uh, juxtaposed with the very sort of, um, what would you call it? Just very um, structured. Um, very um, measured, very precise language, use of language. I find that to be so appealing. Which also reminds me of poetry and what people, mm -hmm. yeah, what, um, what 
cre- what creation happens when we create poetry, when we read poetry, when we, mm-hmm. so thank you again. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and transition to the next uh, kind of more open discussion part of this coffee hour. 